This is our app from the Country Lunch Show on WOOL 91.5 FM from Bell's Falls, Vermont. Let's get back with part four of our February 12th interview with Paleo Mountain Man and Bud Cat 7. Back to what Al was talking about, for instance, Al, the 500 million pounds, 500 million pounds of copper that was extracted from Michigan, for example. When they've was this? Found, they've, they've found a fraction, and it was extracted, and the copper was mined by these archaic people that talk, we're talking about in paleo time. Okay. Okay. So 500 million pounds of copper extracted, but what they've actually dug up as copper artifacts from this country so far can fit in one small boulder. Okay, so where did all the rest of this copper go? And when they do some examination of, of European brass armaments like swords and helmets and stuff, they found traces of Michigan copper in some of those pieces of armor and weapons and whatnot have found traces of Michigan copper in those things at a time, uh, you know, 2,000 years before um, Columbus made his journey there. So there's one of the resources that one of the items that people may have been coming to this country to get, to come into this land to get from distant civilizations, because here is one of the few places in the world where you can get almost pure copper, pure copper. There's not a lot of places in the world that you can get pure copper from, but here in the United States, around the Michigan area, is one of those places. Mm -hmm. Now, they know there's all these ancient mines there that date back thousands and thousands of years, they extracted this 500 million pounds of copper out of there. Where did it go? Okay, They're that brings us... they it up. I, I can see this brings us to the focus point of we only focus or are taught major events. We know very little about what happened that aren't major events. Smugglers or just uh, people that happened. and That's where you're, you're kind of investigating those areas, I see. Didn't you Absolutely. find Didn't you find evidence of um, oxide... Um, molds in the ground. Yes, and that was that was part of that research that I did. Was these oxide molds, which look like a flayed out skin, like if you were to skin an ox, and you had the skin laying out and drying after you tanned it or whatever. You would see the two arms and two legs, and then the main part of the skin where the head is. I mean, I'm sure people have seen. Uh, like a cow, you know, the leather from a cow, you know, it's skin after it's skin. And that's, that's what these oxide um, ingots, as they call them, they're copper ingots in the shape of an oxide. And they were only found in the Mediterranean area, found in Turkey and Egypt, you know, around the Mediterranean. And that's the only place that they thought that they existed until a archaeologist researcher from the University of Michigan found one of these oxides in Michigan. Okay, so wow. that was, you know, that was a curious thing that they found there, and it seemed to be evidence of, an, you know, some sort of major system of exporting of this copper in the, in the um, form of these oxide ingots, these copper oxide ingots, and I saw pictures from the Tennessee Valley of these molds made in the ground. That's how they do it. They make it out a mold out of sand and a piece of flat ground. And then they poured the molten copper into this mold to make the oxide. I saw them right there in the Tennessee Valley in the 1930s when they were doing the hydroelectric dam down there. Before they flooded the area, they did a tiny bit of archaeology there, but I saw them right there. That can't be the a coincidence. The ingot mold. It's not a coincidence. Um, it's like no. the Salutrian and the Clovis. You know, they're, they're exactly like the I, same technology, but they're different names, different people, but they're the same technology on two sides of the water. Um, which and, they didn't expect. They didn't expect. They didn't if, know anything if about you agree that. Now, if, if you agree that there are boats and people sailing across the oceans, then you can say, well, there's a connection. They were sailing, and there was a worldwide 
um, culture of people and a worldwide knowledge and maybe a worldwide and it on. language. And Even it did after carry on. they were gone, it carried on time. for a while. But the point is, is that people have been visiting the Americas since caveman times. Okay, this whole idea that, you know, it wasn't found until Christopher Columbus or Amerigo Vespucci or, or the Vikings or whatever, it's a bunch of nonsense. And if, again, it shows, if they, let's say they did export this 500 million pounds of copper, it just shows the level of organization and infrastructure involved in accomplishing something like that by the people who were already here, you see? So what a story. What a when story. you have this major trade on a, on a large scale, Similar to that, what we do today, no different. You know, the thoughts, the feelings, the, everything is the same as it is today. You're going to want your representatives here, okay? If, you, if, if the influx of timber, copper, food, whatever resources, furs, um, whatever resources to be gotten from here is on such a large scale, it immediately creates sort of dynamics and relationships, okay? So security is always one of them. If, you, if, you, if you're studying like, a bus- if you do like a business course in college and you learn about these things, I took business in college, you learn about these things, you learn about trade and the different relationships that, you know, um, come out of that, you know? These are the similar things. So when you see evidence of, let's say, Vikings, Egyptians, Phoenicians, the Chinese, if you see evidence of that in the Americas, you can almost bet that this was part of that infrastructure, it was part of this relationship, part of this dynamic that was going on here. You had people highly organized here who had already established themselves as uh, producers of whatever it is, whether it be copper, maize, timber, furs, whatever it is, on a, on a vast scale, on a large scale, for their own people, right? And you have people come here and establish a trading relationship with them. Well, these are the things that are invariably going to happen. Hey, let me cut in here. trading with you, yeah. they're going to say, I want to make sure that I get my delivery. I need my delivery. My my country, my civilization, my city, whatever it is, is dependent need on this Need demand. Trade. Need it's demand. So good. It's demand, right? You yeah. have demand, and you want to make sure that that remains unbroken. You know, you want to ensure the consistency of that. So you're going to send agents of people who do the talking and the trading, these administrators or whatever it is, you're going to send, it's like the Romans, okay, when they were conquering and doing whatever, they would automatically um, um, install a garrison, let's say in the city of London, it was called Londinium at the time of the Romans or whatever, they would send a garrison there, and that's, you know, not to ensure, you know, their um, control over there, but not only that, to establish the relationship, because they wanted the resources from There's no point in conquering all these lands. You're absolutely if right. There isn't something to get from it. And you're absolutely right. I can see your point there, Bud Cat 7, about uh, what you're talking about. And uh, I'll tell you, I am going to go to Newport, Rhode Island this year on when I do my vacation. A lot to see there. And to see there. around where the Vikings are. And I'm going to take some pictures and look for some stone walls on there and take some pictures and see what you think. And uh, will they relate? Do they relate to any of the walls that you're talking about? Uh, are there any similarities uh, about that and, and things like that? That's what I'm going to. You got me going on stone walls. There is. No, there is. No, you know what go. you might want to do, Alex? Get in touch with the Rhode Island uh, Historical Society because they've been doing a lot of work. I've been looking at some of their work there, I'm looking at some of this stuff, and they're one of the few people, the Rhode Island Historical Society, one of the few groups that acknowledges the um, aboriginal input into the stone walls. Not 100%, but they're one of the few groups, state groups, um, that acknowledges that these people um, in the past were building in stone. 
so you might want to get in touch with them or at least look at their website before you go because they have some very interesting things on there. I, I often go there. I belong to a lot of historical societies, New England Historical, Massachusetts, Rhode Island. I belong to a lot of historical societies because I want to see what they're doing. All right. Uh, yeah, I can see that, your point. But the only problem I have is, you know, I'll be, I may be taking pictures of they have a lot of tourists down there and a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people that have lived through there and gone through there. How many of them people have walked by those structures and stone walls and said, oh, my, let me put my rock up there, you know, and pick up yeah. a rock and put it on it. Now what have I got? There's, that's been done, too. There's no doubt about that. Oh, no that doubt too. about that. And the populace, there is, yeah. I mean, who Definitely. can, who can and, resist you know, that? They modified some of the stone walls, too. I mean, they moved into an area, they found a stone wall. Many of these stone walls ir are irregular, right, Jimmy? They're not, they don't have, a, like, a flat top. Only in certain areas they do. But for the most part, they're very uneven on the top. Sometimes, like the walls on Jimmy's lower property there, a lot of those large, I mean, they're huge stones, too, built into those walls over there. But it's not, you know, it's just willy-nilly it's not it's not really organized in such a way where it would be flat so i can see the farmers and colonists when they move in they want to improve the wall they take some of the field stone that they pull out of their land there and put it up on the walls they modify them there's no question about it yeah but you know, i, I either, yeah i I've, I've been down to uh first beach and second beach in uh uh newport there and uh if you've ever been there the, they have these incredible, uh, I guess they're naturally made walls where the sand has collected uh, small stones and the whole wall is made like that, like a, like it cemented itself together and grew. And, and it's very beautiful, right. colorful stones and, and, and some shells in there. And a lot of people that go by there will uh, carve their... Yeah carve their yeah. names in there and stuff, you know. It's impossible. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, right. In these uh, critical yeah. areas where you see this beautiful stuff. I have some pictures of, of those walls because they are very, very, very did colorful. You, did you know the petroglyphs in Bellows Falls down in the river, um, when they were discover rediscovered again and again, but um, the town had a s local sculptor go down there and just recarve it. Make them deeper so you could see the petroglyphs better. Oh. So what you're seeing is a recarving of what was there. Uh, it's still there. The images are there, but it's a recarving. And walls, yeah, which is walls do the it's, same you thing. You shouldn't be doing stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And as far as the stone walls are concerned and all the construction, there should be a moratorium in every state in the Northeast that says you can't do anything with those stone walls, whether you own the property or not, or whatever it is. They should, they get, they should put a moratorium on that because they think could just destroy that them would at be any good. time. I don't know if that would happen unless you get I doubt a shift it, where I, people be, actually so thought it. these walls meant something. Yeah, you know, the walls I'm talking about are natural. They're right on right. where the, right on the uh, water there, and they're rock walls because it's pretty high, where say some of the mansions are built up on top but they it's you, i can't figure out how these rocks got made like that you know how these walls got made like that you know but uh it's just a phenomenon to look at those uh made out it of maybe evidence of an ancient construction that's so old it's hard to recognize whether it's natural or not they often have that problem i mean all around the world when they're looking at something and they're trying to determine whether it's man-made or not, they have difficulty a lot of times. Sometimes they can't tell whether it's natural in, or made. In or Peru, not. they shaved top of mountains off and, and actually changed the shape of mountains. And you would yeah. never think they anyone would ever be bold enough to do that. So well, you, you would uh, think right. it was absolutely normal, the shape of the mountain. And there are mountains around the world that were modified. You can find more information by going to YouTube and searching for Paleo Mountain Man or Stonewall Research, Budcat7.